You're about to join Jerry Parker, Marit Siebert, and Niels Kostrup Larsen on their raw and honest journey into the world of systematic investing and learn about the most dependable and consistent yet often overlooked investment strategy. Welcome to the Systematic Investor Podcast Series. Welcome or welcome back to this week's edition of the Systematic Investor Series with Rob Carver and I, Niels Castro Larsen, where each week we take the pulse of a global of the global markets through the lens of a rules-based investor. If you're new to the show, let me start by saying welcome, with the hope that today's episode will trigger your curiosity and hunger for learning, enough to check out the back catalog and listen to past episodes that you may have missed, like my conversation with Mark last week, where we talked about momentum crashes, Bitcoin's recent challenges, and how an inflationary environment may affect trend following. Now, Rob, it is always good to be back with you. How are things where you are in the UK at the moment? The weather is good, which is nice. So it's half-term holiday here. Hopefully we'll have a nice break with some sunshine. And also the whole week, there have been men like building something in, in the house behind mine. So all week I've had like drilling noises. But I did speak to them yesterday and I said, guys, please tell me you're having Saturday off. And of course, they, they were good English workmen. They're like, there's no way we're working at the weekend. So I was like good news and pleased to hear it. We should be in good shape then. Let me do kind of a quick market wrap and then we'll jump into some of, of the portfolios and all of that good stuff. I mean, we did see the US Treasury markets close the month of May, rebounding a little bit in price as we saw yields fall again slightly. The market is still dealing with the prospect of the Fed beginning to discuss curtailing its massive bond buying program. Despite the small decline in yields this week, if you look at the 5 to 10 year range, they still remain about 50 basis points higher than when we began the year. And you can see signs of both kind of uh, inflation in the data and anecdotal evidence of inflation in labor shortages and, and that they are slightly persisting at the moment, at least. Prices for goods and services are rising as economic activity continues to recover. However, the Fed, which is being driven more by its political leaning than by prudent economic analysis, runs the risk of being far behind the curve when they eventually start to ease off the accommodation. The potential for another massive fiscal stimulus exposes the Fed's underlying leaning further. They are clearly pursuing the new administration's agenda, and this policy, quote-unquote, mistake will most likely lead to an eventual further correction in the bond prices to the downside. Lastly, the Federal Reserve's repo facility, which I've mentioned a few weeks now, peaked on Thursday at $495 billion. Friday, meaning yesterday, participants only lent about $480 billion for the three-day long holiday at 0% at the Fed. No doubt there is too much excess liquidity in the banking and probably in the non-banking system at the moment. Now, does this lead to a crisis? It's very hard to say. Probably not. But of course, there's always the possibility that it could. The situation could most likely be managed if the Fed were to begin to ease off the gas pedal ahead of the curve, as opposed to standing on the accelerator as we see right now. On top of this, by the way, the challenges are compounded by literally printing money and now giving it away to people through stimulus packages and not in small amounts. Of course, only time will tell how this plays out, but we do live in interesting times and uh, we should be open to many outcomes, perhaps outcomes that are not written in the traditional textbooks. But Rob, it's been the usual four weeks since we last spoke. Things may have caught your eye in the last month or so. I want to come into some specific assets, but maybe we just talk broadly right now in terms of things that you've noticed in terms of market moves, performance. Yeah. I mean, by the way, I did yeah. hear a rumor, by the way, maybe I should disclose my intent here. I did hear a rumor that you may consider putting laser eyes on your Twitter profile. What's that all about? Yeah, we'll come back to that, I think, probably in a minute. Yeah. It's been an interesting, uh, interesting month. And you're absolutely right to talk about the Fed, you know, the big beasts in the market and the core PC inflation number that came out yesterday was the highest in like 28, 29 years, I think, something like that. So clearly there are inflationary pressures in the economy, but you know the, the Fed and the US government are in a difficult position. Obviously, the, the economy is still not in a great state at the moment. 
There are bits of the economy that are running very hot and there are bits of the economy running very cold. And it's quite hard to deal with that situation with monetary policy, which just applies to everything. Well, actually, if anything, it affects asset prices more perhaps than the real economy. So ideally, you want a situation where you've got monetary policy and fiscal policy working hand in hand. And even when you've got that situation, it's still going to be a very hard thing to come out of. But the interesting thing for me is I'm not really involved in that particular game because uh, I look across my positions and I, I don't really see anything there that's related to to kind of US interest rates. So, you know, I've got my biggest short actually is in BTP, which is in Italian bonds. Maybe there's a relationship there. Also short bubbles, which are, you know, German five years. And then on, on the long side, I'm long gold. So I guess you could argue that's an inflation thing. I'm also long, you know, quite a few of the commodities. So wheat, corn, soya beans, also long platinum. So my portfolio doesn't have a specific bet on US interest rates at the moment because all those signals are kind of flatlining. And there's not really any strong trends or carry there, but it does have what looks a little bit like a, an inflation on bet there. So maybe that's feeding through. In terms of performance, it's been a pretty lackluster few weeks, to be honest. So I was down about 79 basis points and uh, I was just glancing across the PL, and, you know, there's nothing really there that, that jumps out at me and made a bit of money in gold. I lost about a bit of money in platinum. So, you know, it's this kind of obviously not a really obvious story. They're quite nuanced, nuanced, sorry. And then over the last few days since to match with the figures you're going to give now, I'm down about 1.7%. I had a, three weeks of pretty good performance and then I've lost that and some more in the last week. So last week's been quite tough for me. But so yeah, it looks like the portfolio is positioned for a kind of inflation on maybe slightly risk off trade. So it's so interesting to see how that plays out. Yeah, very interesting indeed. I mean, since it's, you know, there's one trading day officially left in the month of May, but it's a US holiday. So most of the market, certainly in our portfolio is going to be closed. So I'm kind of talking about this pretty much as the month of May when I talk about the performance now, because I don't think a lot will happen on Monday, at least not in our portfolio. So it actually was a pretty solid month for us, building on a pretty strong month of April. We did have some corrections, as people will know who've been listening every week. We've been had some corrections mid-month, but still finishing up with a healthy gain. And that really came from most of the sectors, at least this week. They did pretty well, with the exception of grains and fixed income, especially the longer dated bonds. As we talked about earlier, the bonds have actually increased in price a little bit and we're tilted towards the short side on in those particular durations. And that picture is pretty much what we've seen for the month if I look at sort of attributions for the whole month. Also, what's really nice to see on our side is that Lean Hawks has been the best single market in May. And, and the reason I say it's nice to see is because it's a small market yet because we don't really focus too much on on how much AUM we can gather because we want to trade these smaller markets. It also means that these smaller markets can have a meaningful impact from time to time. So that certainly played out in May. Other markets worth mentioning that did well, British pounds, Canadian dollar, coffee, another relatively small market. And then there were a few markets that struggled this month. We saw wheat, soybean, meal, and cotton being the, the worst three. All in all, May looks pretty solid. My trend barometer, it also moved higher this week, and it closed around 49, which is kind of in the higher end of the neutral zone. But really, the positive momentum that we've seen in the last week or so is, is what is going to give our industry, according to, to my guess, is a positive number for the month of May once we see those numbers come out. That's at least my expectation. In terms of our volatility program, after a couple of weeks of range-bound trading in the S&P and VIX during the last five days, meaning the last week, we saw some aggressive volatility trading, mostly selling, and the VIX index moved more than three points lower, while the S&P only gained about 1.1%. It was also a very active trading week in VIX futures as they decoupled a bit from their historical relationship to the S&P. And we did see the VIX futures decline substantially on Wednesday and Thursday relative to the S&P. Overall, we are seeing some pretty low levels volatility-wise. For example, five-day realized volatility slumped to below 4%, 10-day realized headed below 10% annualized. And just for comparison, in 2017, where we had the lowest volatility environment on record, 10-day realized volatility averaged around 6.5% for the whole year. So just putting that in perspective. 
On our side, our volatility program had a good week, but it did finish the month down a little bit. So, so that's where we stand. In terms of my own trend following model and its performance, where I can go into more detail, it came back during the last week of May. It ended pretty much flat for the month, leaving it down 30 bips for the month of 14.05% year to date. Performance so far for the month, even if we have one day left, is split between group two models doing well, up about 1%, a little bit more. And then you had small losses in group three models and group one models. In terms of sector attributions for the month, base metals did best, followed by currencies. And bonds and softs commodities came in in a tie, really, for third position. And the worst sector for the month really was equities by some margin. And then it was followed by grains and nothing else really lost money in terms of sectors. And once we drill down to the single markets, SMI, the Swiss market index, came out best. Followed really by four other markets that were pretty much in line performance-wise in May. And that was zinc, Canadian dollar, gold and copper. And then at the bottom this month, we saw the DAX, the NASDAQ, and Australian SPY, so all of them equity markets. And then if we look at the trading for the week, the system overall had a pretty quiet week. It started out by taking some profits on a long copper position. Then it bought a little bit of euro dollar, and I mean the interest rate, not the currency here. It bought some SMI, it bought a little bit of euro, the currency this time, and then Swiss francs. And then it took some profits on soybean position. And then finished the week by going long the Australian SPY for a couple of the models. And in terms of riskiness, when we talk about how much would the system lose if it got stopped out of everything on Monday, say, it would stand to lose around 15.35%, which is up around, uh, well, it's up from 11.95% last week. So stops, you could say, have not really moved quite as quickly as the markets have. So it's expanded a bit. Plus, there are a few new positions that's been added, and that obviously adds to the open risk. I think overall, the system had about 10 trades for the week, so nothing too dramatic and not very busy. Now, before we move into some of the questions that came from Dan, John, Pee Wee, and Zayed, I want to go back to this rumor that I heard <laughs> about the laser eyes. Yeah. It says, perhaps, or it, it, it talks about you, perhaps, converting to the Jerry and Moritz side in terms of Bitcoin. <laughs> Tell me what's going on there. Rob. Well, I mean, converting is a strong word. So I'm still extremely negative. The whole idea of Bitcoin as a long-term store of value as a currency, or I think it's terrible for the environment. You know, I know people say, oh, it uses a lot of renewable energy, but, gen you know, it's still using more energy than it would if it didn't exist. And now, you know, there's a new cryptocurrency, which is using up hard drive space. I mean, it's just, to me, it's bonkers. Having said that, though, just because I don't like something doesn't mean I shouldn't trade it because, you know, it, at the end of the day, it's an asset class, it's uncorrelated. And I have said for many years, well, I've actually, the first time I looked at it, I said, well, I'm not going to trade Bitcoin sort of spot, if you like, cash because of the operational difficulties and, of course, the, you know, the potential um, counterparty risk. So I said, but if someone introduced a Bitcoin future, I trade it. Then someone did introduce a Bitcoin future, of course, a few years ago now, but it was a very big contract. It was five Bitcoins in size and it's just, you know, and there was another contract that I think was one Bitcoin in size. But because the risk of the asset is so high, it was just too big to put into my portfolio. I didn't have the risk capital to trade it. So I, I then said, well, if someone brings out a micro, you know, a smaller Bitcoin future, like the equivalent of the, you know, the e-mini for S&Ps, then I'll definitely trade it. So so what happened was a bit of a coincidence in that I've been, been talking for a while now about adding a lot of extra markets to my portfolio because, Nils, you know, you talk about these markets in your portfolio that are quite small, which added value. And the main problem I have is, is someone with a relatively small amount of capital because at the end of the day, I'm a retail trader. I'll be one with a, you know, with a largish portfolio for a retail trader. I can't just trade the range of markets that, that you guys with your institutional money can trade. But I've been playing around with sort of ways of, of dealing with that issue. And so I'm hoping that in the next few months, I'm going to be changing the way I trade. It's such that there'll be a large variety of markets I can take positions in. Although, of course, I'll only be trading a selection of those based on signal strength at any given time. So the, the first thing I, I wanted to do is actually start collecting price data on a lot more markets than I'm, than I'm collecting now. So I, I went, did it nice and systematically, and people can read about my blog if they like. I did a, a, a sort of search for every futures market in the world, pretty much. And there, you know, there are several hundred out there, really. Then I sort of got rid of the ones which I'd have to pay a lot of money to buy the data. So apparently that was the ICE contracts in London, for example, for which the data is very expensive. So that means things like 
you know, LIBOR futures, for example, and, um, you know, UK gas are, are off, um, UK crude oil are off, off the menu, sadly. But that's not, not too bad, 20 contracts out the window then. And then I filtered down to look at markets which were either too expensive to trade or which were just you know, too big. So the, you know, the big Bitcoin futures contract would come into that category, as would, for example, the lumber contract. That's also a very big contract, too big for me. And also any anything which had too little volume. And my cutoff of volume was to say, if it trades less than 100 contracts a day, or if it trades less than um, $1.25 million of annualized risk per day, then that's too small. Because it would mean even with my small portfolio, I'd still be more than one percent of the market, and to me that seemed a bit crazy. So that that also cut out, cuts out a few things, like 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 milk, for example. I think right. Ironically, milk is too illiquid for me to trade. You know, cue where uh, joke snare drum there. So anyway, I, d- I did all this, and, and I had all these markets. Started collecting these markets, price data, and so on and so forth. And uh, at the same time, I thought, well, maybe I should actually start trading one of these new markets in my strategy as it is now. And there's an obvious market to to get rid of, which is Palladium, which I hadn't, I had in my portfolio, but because of the risk, I'd never actually, I hadn't really taken a full con- a contract's worth of risk in it for a couple of years. So it wasn't really doing anything in my portfolio. It was kind of wasting risk capital. And I thought, well, what can I add into this the portfolio to replace Palladium? And by sheer coincidence, literally three days beforehand, the CME had launched the micro Bitcoin future, which is worth one tenth of a Bitcoin. And that means it, it's kind of size wise. And I thought, well, I really got to put my money where my mouth is. I've been saying for years, I would trade Bitcoin. Although I hate it, I would trade it if I could. Now I can. Well, I, I really ought to trade it. And of course, it's the classic thing where you look at the chart for Bitcoin and it's a straight line going up or a few, you know, the time I was doing this exercise, which was about three or three and a half weeks ago now. And a couple of people I was chatting to online were like, you must be crazy. We're adding an asset like this at its all time high, pretty much. Does that make any sense? And I thought, well, at the end of the day, if, if I'm going to tell people you should trade systematically and not rely on emotion or anything like this, then I, I really ought to put my money where my mouth is and say, well, the fact that I hate Bitcoin, the fact that it, the price is at an all-time high is completely irrelevant. I'm going to add it to my system. And if my system wants to be long, and of course it's going to be long because it's been going up in a straight line, although the contango and backwardation is against it because of the well-known effect that near Bitcoin futures are overpriced, which of course Moritz takes advantage with his arbitrage strategy. But the you know the trend signal was overwhelming the carry. Of course, I was going to go long, but I, I couldn't really do anything. You know, I felt if I didn't do this, I would kind of be ignoring everything I told other people to do and, and making effectively a discretionary decision. And I do occasionally make discretionary decisions, but only when I feel I have more information. Do I really have more information than my model does about where Bitcoin is going? Of course, I don't. I've got no idea about it. No idea at all. So yeah, I, I put it on Twitter. I thought I, I should own up that I'm I'm, I'm joining the ranks of the you know the the laser eyes and the diamond hands and, and uh, all these people. And sure enough, on, on the... Let's hear what day you actually entered Okay, so trade. it was the 10th of May. And I can tell you the time. It was 11.23 and 30 seconds, because the trade is time-stamped. So I bought the... Let's have the, hold the details. Yeah, the May, I level. bought one contract of the May Bitcoin future. So I'm not clearly at whale status yet here, more, more, you know, Anil's. And oh, I hate to say this, the price I paid was 58215 And it's a one-tenth okay. contract. So effectively, I was okay. exposed to $5,820 worth of Bitcoin. Okay, so before you continue the story, I want to dig into this a little bit. Okay, so because I think this is an issue that a lot of people will face, especially if they are adding new markets and, of, and that the market is in the middle of a trend and maybe even worse, like Bitcoin, it's been going for a while and it's almost been going vertically, right? Okay, so where, and you could be general, you don't have to be specific, where generally would your stop be on a trade like that? And how did you have to do a little bit of massaging to not take too much risk? Because clearly your stop would be further away than it would normally be at an entry, I would imagine. So how did you deal with that? I mean, I didn't really do anything special. I just put it into my system exactly like any other market. And that meant because of the size of the risk and the risk allocation, that meant that even though the forecast was pretty strong, it was only going to buy a single contract. So I, you know, there was never any danger I was going to buy a hundred contracts of this. No. In terms of the stock, well, obviously I, I don't have explicit stop losses in my system, it, but it kind of it's kind of going to get out of position when the trend moves against it. Pretty much, I can tell you that I probably I sold that thing at I don't have the exact price in front of me or the exact date, 
but so can I, I help you may 17th <laughs> does that ring a bell yeah okay it does <laughs> yeah so a week later basically and I, I don't know what the price has gone down by now but, but about fifteen thousand dollars maybe something like that was it well, like the mid 40s then you got out pretty well 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 the, i mean this is but the system did it right the system said well the trend has turned yeah. the volatility has probably increased a bit the position is now you know it's not position it should be cut and in fact i had a look at my risk report this morning and my strategy report and i do actually have a very slight positive forecast in bitcoin at the moment but it, it's tiny so just to give you an idea the way my system works a forecast of 10 is an average size position a forecast of 20 is very bullish and so on it has a forecast of 0.24 so it's tiny and how can it be bullish at this stage that's kind of curious because the market hasn't really done much on the up. It hasn't, but I guess that there's probably still a lot, you know, don't forget I'm tra trading a blend of momentum signals. Right. Okay. So I've got slow, very slow momentum in there as, as well as okay. faster momentum. Of course, the faster momentum has flipped quite quickly. The slow momentum is probably still positive. You know, the carry is probably slightly negative, sure. but net it's basically, it is as good as flat. I mean, 0 0.24 okay. is effectively flat. I'm never going to take yeah. a position with a position yeah. that size. Well, this is, this is interesting. It's very useful. It's very educational. I'm sure a lot of people kind of enjoy to hear that very human journey into the uh, world of Bitcoin. And I completely agree with you. It's a market. And even whether people agree or don't agree about all the narrative, it doesn't prevent us from trading it at all. It, and it's quite interesting. I mean, one thing, since we are on the topic of Bitcoin, so let's just jump into it a little bit and obviously a complete beginner in this area in terms of knowledge, right? But I am following it on the side and I am following especially the narrative on the side. And what is a little bit interesting to me is that a lot of the narrative have been about how this is decentralized, nobody controls it, blah, blah, blah. And then you get this massive sell-off, right? You know, 51, 52% in two, two or three weeks, 25% or more in one day, some of the other cryptos a lot more in one day, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, a lot of this driven by tweets and statements from a certain Mr. Musk mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. And the Chinese, and then you Chinese hear, government, of course, as well. Right. Yeah. I mean, all this, all these excuses coming out now that the price is going down, you know, some of the, to be frank, some of the people who were pumping it up with all sorts of narrative uh, are now trying to find excuses for why and blaming uh, narrative for the price going down. But what I picked up and I, I find it quite interesting is suddenly after Mr. Musk comes out saying, oh, I don't really like this, you know, in terms of the kind of ESG footprint of crypto, et cetera, et cetera. Then another guy, Michael Saylor, who's obviously been a big proponent, he's borrowed billions of dollars to invest in crypto, et cetera, et cetera, and obviously done very well from it. Don't take, I'm not going to take that away from him. But he's certainly been part of the narrative, in my opinion. Suddenly he arranges a meeting with miners and Mr. Musk. And from what I understand from people a lot more into it. This is about something where these people potentially could make, could do things that kind of changes parts of the of Bitcoin. Now, I'm not saying that miners control Bitcoin because I don't think that is correct. There are other people who can make changes, but in theory, if you have I think more than 51% of the hash rate or whatever it's called, you can make changes, right? So here is the thing. This is what I think where people, I think, are being a little bit hypocritical, frankly. They talk about the wonders of decentralization, nobody controls it, et cetera, et cetera. And as soon as one guy comes out saying, well, hang on, I don't really like this about the Bitcoin, secret meetings are arranged for potentially, or at least discussing, certain things that could change Bitcoin, which is not really meant to be able to happen because it is meant to be decentralized. Nobody should control it. But it has the taste of one pe person and a few people close to uh, that person coming together to make changes. And I think that's a shame because actually I think the whole decentralized idea is a good one. But now it's kind of, oh, is it really decentralized or, or not? I don't think it ever was, Niels. I re recently read a, a book I can't remember if I mentioned on the podcast before, but I read, I read a book called The Block Size War, which is about the this change to the, the block size in, in Bitcoin. And, you know, 
I'm not going to. Is that what they refer to as the New York Agreement a few years ago? Or yeah, I mean, uh, you know, th- this book okay. is quite it's quite hard to follow, especially if, like both of us. You're not like a bit a Bitcoin specialist, and I had to do a lot of googling and looking things up. And it's written by a guy actually who is a portfolio manager at a well, he was a portfolio manager at a large UK asset manager. So he kind of he's kind of coming it from the outside as well, although he becomes an insider, I guess. But it's talking about you know the politics and the meetings and the sides attacking each other and all this kind of stuff and you're like well you know it doesn't and this is all happening over from about i think about 2015 to about 2018 so at the end of the day it was this thing was created by one guy probably no one knows who they are of course there's been lots of theories so it was controlled by one person at the beginning now you know the la- a consortium of the largest miners and probably some developers could probably change it do anything they wanted with it, I guess. Uh, the, it's, but it, reading this book, it is quite hard to get all these people to agree, of course, because they've all got different agendas and, you know, they're, they're not like their best friends or anything. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it's, I guess I have two, three, three sort of feelings about Bitcoin, right? So one, as an economist uh, and as someone who believes in the environment, I kind of think, well, this is a bad thing and a crazy thing and it will never work. Like you and reading this book, I'm kind of interested in politics and the story. And it's a good story, right? It's an interesting story and it's in the news a lot. And you can't fail to kind of hear about it. And, and you know, and there are aspects of it that I find intellectually interesting, right? Or I wouldn't read a whole book on the subject. But then I, then it's then again, it's just another asset I, I now trade. And, you know, I, I don't really care that much about the, you know, the, what's going on in the, 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 you know, whether there's farmers meeting up to to kind of, rig the corn market as long as you know at the end of the day eventually some trends develop and i can make a bit of money in corn every now and then that's fine you know so that you know i think i you kind of have to have these three hats on but it, but at the end of the day and this is the important message i was trying to say when i did get around to actually putting bitcoin into my portfolio at the end of the day when you're actually trading this thing you've got to be completely just put all these feelings and and stuff aside and even actually put any anything you know about the asset class aside completely aside because the more you learn and understand about asset classes, the more tempted you are going to be, I think, to try and fiddle with your models. And, you know, I I have to watch myself with, say, the fixed income things in my portfolio, because that's kind of the asset class that I know the most about and I've traded the most. I have to be very careful not to start tweaking my bond and my euro dollar model, because I think I know more about fixed income than my model does. You have to try to put that to one side. With Bitcoin, that's very easy for me. I'm perfectly happy to say I I find it an interesting story and I, I disagree with it kind of emotionally, but I certainly don't feel I know more about where its price is going than, than my, my system does. Yeah, I mean, it's funny you say that. So I don't actually disagree with Bitcoin. Don't I disagree with we need something that is not centralized, that is ideally not controlled. And going back to the farmers you mentioned about, you know, the, the difference to me is that farmers don't claim that it's a decentralized market and nobody controls the price. I think a lot of people think that, yeah, there probably is a bit of a mafia in, you know, controlling the some weeds, of these. The, the and, mafia. And, yeah, <laughs> right, exactly. So so that that's my argument here. That's what I find it's harder for me to accept is just that you have one narrative on one side, but then when that doesn't quite work, you know, it's again going back to this, you know, pay attention to what they do, not what they say kind of thing that it just spoils the spoils it a little bit for me, even though it's not going to make a beans of difference. I think a lot of people, because it is a bit of a, I think it is a little bit of a religion is not the right word, but it's a belief. It's a right? cult. It's a cult. It. it's a cult. You're yeah. either in or you're exactly. out. And yeah. even though I think both you and I, we're kind of in, even though we don't need all the, we don't need to be convinced of of certain things we just see that it moves and we can trade it and that's all good do i think it's a good insurance policy somehow to just have a little bit of it stashed away like a one percent nothing to do with anything probably yes like i would say the same about gold but it has nothing to do with trading or investing for that matter it's just being sensible and being open to the philosophy of trend following and that is we have no idea what's going to happen so could bitcoin go to a million of course it can can it go to zero absolutely so i i find it interesting and i'm certainly going to pay attention to how the story unfolds Mm. there is what i will say though what i will say though since you've embraced bitcoin (laughs) a bit you might also want to then think about uh, ethereum i know there's no micro uh, yeah, that's a really that's a big contract at the moment. Two, yeah. yeah, but if they but make a micro, the reason, 
the reason I say that, and, and again, I'm, I don't want to buy into all the details because I don't know enough about it, but I did hear a very interesting podcast this week with a guy, and I think he was like, a, either he's a medical doctor or he's a medical student or something like that. And he was, intru- he was, uh, he was interviewed on, on, on the Hidden Forces podcast, which actually is a great podcast. Unfortunately, not all the content is free, so, but from what I could hear on the free version of it, he was very interesting. And he talked about the changes that's coming to Ethereum. And what those changes actually, in his opinion, equate to in terms of the halving cycle that you know from Bitcoin. And he was saying, when you look at all the changes that are starting coming online this summer, and I don't want to sound like I'm talking Ethereum up, I have no idea what's going to going to do. But he did say, and he argued for it quite well, that it's going to be like equate e- equivalent of like a triple halfening of, of Bitcoin. I mean, they're, they're going to take so much of the supply out and so on and so forth. It was just fascinating. I learned a lot from listening to this guy and I have no idea what the prices are, are going to do. I see this Saturday when we're talking that the weekend is a little bit red number showing up for the crypto space yet again and all of that. And of course, that is a little bit of a downside, I think, for people like trend followers to include or to trade the future side of a market that actually trades seven days a week. Because the moves of the, the, the weekend, we can't participate in, and they can be quite significant. But it's the only thing you can do, I think, if you want to stick with this completely futures-based type approach. And the, that we the future by. actually is, tra- even though it doesn't trade at weekends, it does trade 24 hours a day. So Yeah, yeah, um, but not the two yeah. Saturdays. Yeah, I just had a quick look at my, my spreadsheet, and the contract size for Ethereum is $400,000 of annualized risk, which is, you know, way too much for me. So, so But uh, that, that's with a, a price uh, with $50 per point if they... Brought it down to one dollars a point, then definitely I would look at trading that. Yeah, yeah. I just wait Anyways, one more point before we move off Bitcoin, yeah, which is actually sure. what's the thing that struck me when you were talking about this idea of Bitcoin being controlled by a small group of people. So one one thing I do have a conversation about occasionally is should you trade a market where it's being controlled by some deeper mysterious forces? So I, I you know, where it, obviously if a market is basically being just completely controlled, you know, one person can at a whim move exactly where they want it to. Well, it. I, I think that's a dangerous situation to be in as a trader because, you know, there's no way the market can develop its kind of natural patterns and things like that. But at the end of the day, all markets sit in a continuum. So there, there probably are no markets that are completely free from kind of, you know, big whales who are able to move them. Obviously, if you trade, you know, US treasuries, then at the end of the day, there's a huge whale in the market, which is the Fed. and They may do unpredictable things and you just have to live with that. But the Fed does not control the market completely. And, you know, if you're really worried, then maybe stay away from the short end, which the Fed has got more control over than the long end, right? But then at the other extreme, you've got something like the Euro-Swiss exchange rate in the period between 2011 and 2015, when it was fixed against the Euro. So that was a situation where I would not have traded that market. And, uh, you know, I, I did encourage people who were trading it to stop because there was almost no volatility in the market. So any position you were taking was either was effectively a, a call option on Sorry, a put option. You were either selling or buying that put option. If you were selling it, you were taking a massive risk for a tiny return. If you were buying that put option, well, fair, you know, you're basically betting on them removing the peg. Fair enough. But that's maybe a valid trading strategy, but it's not really an asset you can trend follow, I think. So I do think you have to be to think about this, but markets move quite a long way down that continuum before I would start saying, well, this market is no longer quote unquote a free market and it's just being too controlled by one or two actors and therefore. It's too dangerous to be in that market. I don't think Bitcoin is anywhere near that point yet. I, th- I think even though Elon Musk can move the price with a couple of tweets, it's a completely different situation from where you've got a central bank that can control a currency very precisely within a narrow band. That's a situation I don't think you should be in. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned Elon Musk. I mean, I, I still can't quite comprehend that he's allowed to talk about these coins as he is when he's disclosed that he has a huge investment uh, in them. I have no idea what the SEC is doing and why they're not interfering here. Well, they were unable to control him full stop, It just seems completely crazy. I mean, what more do you have to do than to to manipulate markets publicly to get into some kind of uh, trouble? Clearly, uh, he can do whatever he wants. It seems another thing that just with the whole crypto space that I find interesting is that we as participants in the trend following world and managed futures world and been doing this for many decades. One of the frustration frustrations that I find is that when you look at 
how you can really find a lot of evidence of the including managed futures or trend following in an overall portfolio, how it really can reduce the risk and improve the return. So anyone really should have this in your portfolio, yet regulators have for years and to some extent still are making it very difficult for us to allow retail investors to participate at a low cost into these strategies. Yet at the same time, an 18-year-old with no experience can open an account and trade cryptocurrencies like there was no tomorrow, lose a lot of money in no time from their phone, Yeah, right? I mean, it, is weird. it just seems strange. I'll tell you actually a little story, a very little story, because you know, then we'll we stop this crypto discussion. So when I actually went out to buy these futures, the sort of day one, I set my system up to execute the trade and then press the button and nothing happened. So I contacted my broker and said, well, what's going on here? And they said, well, you're not authorized to trade in the UK. You have to be authorized to trade crypto derivatives. So anyone can buy Bitcoin cash in their wallet and do all that kind of stuff. But if you want to trade a derivative of a cryptocurrency, you need to be what's known as a MIFID professional customer. And although it was very quick and easy for me to become a MIFID professional customer, because you have to demonstrate a certain amount of experience, which obviously I'm a threshold that I, I pass comfortably. I hadn't actually bothered doing that before because I'd never needed to trade anything that was categorized as dangerous. But of course, to me, the fact that I'm trading like a Bitcoin future on an exchange when I've been trading all these other futures already without any authorization issues is completely different from kind of signing up to some kind of dodgy Cypress broker bucket shop that's offering unlicensed, unregulated binary options on crypto or something like that. It, it kind of catches everyone in the same bucket. So with a hundred times leverage. With, with exactly a hundred times leverage compared to my, you know, my, my modest fully margined position in the micro Bitcoin on on the CME, which, you know, is is pretty straightforward. So yeah, I mean it's hard for regulators obviously to well it's very hard. I mean it wasn't impossible for them to ban Bitcoin completely, right? I mean you you just couldn't do it. And we shouldn't I no, mean we exactly shouldn't. I mean again it's a free world, right? We shouldn't do that. But you're right, the kind of mismatch between what as institutional people working in, you know, kind of the, the proper quote unquote financial space, what the hoops that we have to do or would have to jump through to offer stuff to retail traders. And then, you know, my example is a retail trader of what I can or cannot do without authorization. You know, there are no shades of grey with regulation, of course. It's like black or white. And, you know, in some cases it seems like they're going too far. In other cases it seems like they haven't got far enough and they're never going to get it right, of course. But yeah, plenty of people losing money in all kinds of unregulated things, unregulated FX scams and unregulated crypto and all this kind of stuff. But if you're regulated, then, you know, you have to dot the I's and cross the T's and really, really be very careful selling to retail investors. And of course, if any regulators are listening to us today, we just want to say we love yeah, you regulators. Absolutely. No doubt about that. You're doing a great job. So uh, keep doing that. Elon Musk, yeah. we love you too. We Because I hear he's got quite a good legal team. So we love him as well. Yeah. Okay. All right. So if anyone tuned in for the first time to listen to this systematic investor series. Don't be confused. No. This is not a Bitcoin podcast in general. We just like to be kind of very open about what we do. And since this came up today, it became a little bit of a feature in our conversation. Now, let's move back to some of the questions we got today. We had questions from Dan, John, Pee Wee, and Said. So let me jump to the question from Dan first, Rob. And we also have a couple of interesting topics, by the way, later on today that you brought up and I found one. So so stick with us. Uh, I think it's going to be a fun and interesting conversation as we move on. So anyway, Dan writes in, do you think fitting by instrument makes sense for intraday trend following? I think this relates to a blog post you, ra you um, wrote. So maybe you need to give us a little bit of context what fitting by instrument means. Yeah. So I've said for a long time that I don't believe you should kind of fit your system so it trades each instrument differently. And I think, Niels, you're on the same page with me as this. Well, almost. Almost, yeah, I guess so. So we're never on exactly the same page. It would be a very boring conversation, wouldn't it? So just taking a simple example of saying, well, how fast should you trade a particular market? Should you trade it slowly or quickly? Well, it's going to depend on costs, of course, but it's also going to depend on things like how correlated those different momentum signals are. But, you know, whether in some markets, for example, it looks like in equity indices that you need to trade a bit slower, for example. It looks like that's the case. In bond markets, it looks like you can trade momentum more effectively at the front of the curve, at the back of the curve, carry seems to work better. There seem to be these effects. So the question is whether you should actually calibrate your system individually for each, each trading instrument that you trade and have a different set of 
say, momentum weights or momentum versus carry or something more sophisticated, perhaps. So I have this habit of saying very strongly, oh, this is definitely the true. This is definitely true. And people, very occasionally, people pick me up and say, well, prove it, Rob. You know, is this really the case? And I thought, well, yeah, I will. I will go and do this. So I, I fitted my system and I fitted it diff- three different ways. First of all, I fitted it by instrument. So each instrument was allowed to pick its own best set of weights. And then I did what I prefer to do, which is to basically say, well, all instruments are the same. So I'm going to pull all the data I've got across all my different instruments together. And I'm going to fit basically one model that will work on everything. And it will not be the best model for S&P and it will not be the best model for corn, but it should be the best model on average. But I do allow costs to come into that, which means that if things are very expensive to trade, well, I'll probably trade them for S&P, but I won't trade them in euro dollar because that's more expensive. But costs aside, it would be the same model for everything. And then I, th- I tried something in the middle, which, which was to say, well, I want to fit things that are, I want to do a halfway house where I pull some information together, but I only, I pull together things that are similar. So maybe it's the case that, for example, we should trade all the bonds the same kind of way. So we should pull the data for the bonds together, fit a model for them and trade them like that. And that's actually the way things were done at AHL when I w- was working there. They probably do it differently now. But I didn't want to do it by asset class. I wanted to try something different. So I actually used a, a machine learning algorithm. So I'm getting very with it this week, Niels. I've got I bought Bitcoin. I've got, I'm using machine learning algorithms. You know, before you know it, I'm going to be, be a robot up today. Soon. Absolutely, yeah. I, I, I'm almost in the 20th century, or maybe I'll join the 21st century. So I, I used K nearest neighbors clustering algorithm. But basically, the idea is that you fit things that you, if things have got similarish weights then you say, well, these are things are quite similar. And sometimes that comes out by asset class, but other times it gives you surprises, right? So it doesn't always fit neatly into asset class buckets, although the clusters do look quite a lot like asset classes. So that kind of suggests that generally speaking, asset classes tend to tr- behave in similar ways. And I tried all these three methods out and I, I found that the, the second best thing you could do was actually to do what I thought you should do, which is just to trade everything exactly the same, pull all the information together, but the best thing of all, actually, was to take all of those three methods and then average the result. And this is a well-known effect in portfolio optimization, that whenever you're doing any kind of averaging of weights, you'll produce something that's generally more robust than the original. That was the, the blog post I wrote. Anyway, the reason for the comment is I made a throwaway comment at the top of the blog post saying, well, it might be the case if you're trading more quickly that you should actually fit things by instrument. So... I think the logic for, for doing it, pulling everything together is because of the kind of trading rules that we're using, they're quite slow. We think they've worked for a long time. We don't have much data to work with. The, the you know They're not like amazingly brilliant in terms of sharp ratio individually. The performance comes from diversifying across lots of these different things. The, but in a, if you're trading more quickly, well, you've kind of got a lot more data because you've got a lot more data points. And it might, it kind of intuitively makes more sense to me that there might be shorter term trading rules might work quite differently for different instruments. Because at that level of granularity, you've kind of got the the push and pull of different participants in the market. You know, you've got the farmers in the wheat market trading against each other. And then Bitcoin, you've got a whole bunch of other people trading against each other. And maybe at that shorter time scale, you do get effects that are more kind of market specific. So the answer to the original question, which is, you know, did, would it at a faster time frame, so in, with intraday trend following, for example, would it make more sense to to fit things to individually to each market? I kind of intuitively think it might make a bit more sense, but I haven't actually tested it because that's just not the world that, that I live in. So maybe if there's anyone out there listening who does trade, you know, more quick models that, than we do, maybe they can chip in and and and, and answer that question for well, us. Well, I might be able to answer it for you because I remember oh. I talked to you about this very particular topic uh, maybe last month or the oh. month before. Really, your memory's better than mine. I mentioned that I've been working on a shorter term model, right, for oh, a number of yes. years. And yes. where I thought, and this is something that I actually believe to be true, and that is that we shouldn't necessarily trade everything the same. We should divide it. So what I uh, explained and what I did was, together with a friend, I should say, was really to say, okay, let's divide the portfolio or the, let's divide the model into three buckets. So, right, you have your universal sec- sections, uh, you know, all markets in one bucket, you have your sectors and you have individual markets. But in my case, I did not look at clusters of certain things. I just thought of it as sectors, right? So base yeah, metals, yeah. Asset whatever. Classes, Asset basically, classes, basically. Yeah. Right. I think this is a conversation we had offline after the podcast. Oh, maybe it's finished, after. Yeah, maybe, okay, yeah. maybe it's after the so, offline, yeah. So the, the listeners who are listening are going, I don't remember this. Right. 
We we did have this conversation. We did have but this it was after conversation. The podcast yeah. had finished. Yeah. So anyway, so we been working on this for a number of years in our spare time and and the results actually and and so this particular momentum model is pretty short kind of a week's average holding 7 10 days average holding period so it's not trend following ex- except there's still momentum but it's not trend following per se or at least people will say short term trend following that's fine and what i will say is that i'm very encouraged by what i've seen in the data in terms of blending that and i we get to the same result as you did, meaning that the best thing is actually to blend. I don't know about the second best. I haven't looked into that and all that stuff, but it's certainly very good idea to blend. Now, I, I don't know that I would feel comfortable doing it in a pure trend following portfolio, meaning that I don't know, I haven't seen the data there, but pr- I would imagine, and I can kind of see Jerry falling off his treadmill right now and listening to this, Rob. Um, his, pa- his parents have just fallen off his shoulders. <laughs> so so we need to be careful here what we say, yeah. but I kind of like the idea of not always having to stick with this idea that everything the same. At the same time, I truly agree with the original philosophy that we don't know anything. But when I hear that, when I hear people say, yeah, but we don't know anything, we should just trade everything the same. I don't know why blending three different methodologies goes against that. Because actually, I think it doesn't. I think it goes to the point that we don't know anything. So let's just yeah. diversify further. Yeah. That's how I think about it. This is how I kind of justify it to myself that actually what I might be doing here, maybe I should test it on a trend following portfolio, but I'm not. I haven't gone, gone that far. But uh, I think it's yeah. interesting. I, 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 did you say that you've implemented this or just tested it? So I've tested it. And actually, as part of my kind of revamp of my right. system to trade all these extra markets, literally uh, this morning, I was running a fitting exercise. Yeah. So I'm literally in the middle of refitting my model in exactly this way. Yeah. So one thing about the blending is nice for a couple of reasons. One is because it, it the, there's kind of m- mathematical reasons why an average of, of portfolio weights will be more stable and robust than a sing- any single optimization, even if that optimization is using more data than the the original set of, you know, than, you know, so you, for example, if you were to just randomly choose groups of, and I've done this as well, randomly choose groups of five instruments of every portfolio and just take a, just optimize on those five instruments and they take an average of all of those weights and it's just random. You just do this over and over again. You'll end up with a very nice, robust set of portfolio weights, even though you've just said, oh, I don't know anything about asset classes. I'm just going to randomly pick five things and just average across those. The other nice thing about the blending is it kind of corrects for the theory being wrong. So for example, if it's true that instrument level fitting works really well, then the instrument level weights will come out really differently. And the globe, they'll be kind of pulled back to the global weights by the averaging, which makes it more robust. But you'll still get a lot of the benefit from the fact that you've got instrument specific weights that are, that are you know, if, they're out, if they work out a sample, will add extra performance to your portfolio. If, on the other hand, there isn't really much there and actually the instrument level weights end up being pretty similar, which if your portfolio methodologies are robust, they will be. In other words, there isn't enough evidence there to suggest you should have different weights for individual instruments. Then all the blending will do is give you essentially something that's just slightly different from the the kind of globally pooled portfolio, but again, hopefully more robust. So it's it's a nice it's a nice technique for that particular method. And of course, one of the nice things about taking an average is you, you can do different kinds of averages. So you could do 50-50 between the global portfolio and individual instruments, or you could do one third between global asset class and total, or you could do any, you know, as long as you're averaging things, it will generally produce a nicer result. Of course, it takes a bit more time to do and it's in terms of back testing, it's, it's a bit more time consuming. But in, if, to produce weights, you're actually going to run your live production system on it. it you know, it's quite nice, I think. Well, now that we've given all our secrets away, Rob, <laughs> let's take another question. Yeah. So this is from John, and John writes couple of episodes ago, you said you treat, and this must be you, I think, you said you treat your future system like it has 100% performance fee. From your yearly reviews, you clearly have a stock slash ETF portfolio that grows and compounds. Why long-term wealth management store only equity slash bonds? Let me try and decipher that sentence a little bit. So I think the question is here that John is a little bit unsure why you only allocate your profits back to 
part of your portfolio because he goes on to say i want to i want to add to this it's not a question about real time compounding and sizing adjustments to your future system i assume real time adjustments then in drawdowns of original capital as you and jerry advocate but said that you had a good year after paying taxes uh, on gains if trading for a living putting money away to live off you still have say 5% uh, plus from the last year's initial capital why put that into stocks bonds versus upping your futures capital with that money for the next year yeah i can i understand the question so there's kind of two two related issues here the first is how much of your money should you put into say a futures trading system and how much into long only investments now there are lots of factors that come into this so if you look just at pure sharp ratio, the sharp, the expected sharp ratio, the realized sharp ratio of my futures trading system is considerably higher than my long only investments, which you kind of expect. The risk is different, but I can change the risk on my futures trading system very easily just by pulling a lever. So that's not really an issue at all. Then there's things around things like tax. So for example, I can't trade futures inside like tax sheltered accounts. So I'm always going to want to put as much money as I can into tax sheltered accounts. You know, it's only only natural. So, you know, that that kind of comes into it. But the and then of course, once you've made that initial decision about what that allocation should be, so let's say it's 75%, 25%, for example. I mean, it's that is not my real numbers, which I'm not going to tell tell you because that would you'd be able to back out from that what my total portfolio size is and I uh, don't want to share that on that secret on the podcast. But you can, let's suppose it's 25, 75. Well, if you're making more money in your future system than you are in your long-only portfolio and you're doing what I do, which is withdraw all profits, then what's going to happen over time, assuming that you've got a, a net positive growth rate, is that the future system is going to become a smaller and smaller proportion of your net wealth. So that initial sizing decision, even if that was optimal, will over time gradually become less optimal. So, you know, let, let's let say in 20 years time, I'm still doing everything the way I'm doing now. I suppose I've had, an, you know, you know, um, I've managed to compound my wealth very successfully. Well, it's quite possible that my futures portfolio would be down to, you know, quite a low proportion of my asset base. It could be starting from 25%, it could be down to less than 10%, which is arguably, you know, very suboptimal. Question is why I do that, and the, there is no scientific answer to your question. It, it, it's completely psychological. It, it's basically that I view my trading account as an account that could go to zero tomorrow, and I'm, I, 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 that's extremely unlikely. But that's the sort of attitude I take to it. So I like I treat it as this black box from which, and I think I've used this metaphor in the last episode. This black box which occasionally spits out money, and it's effectively like a hedge fund with a hundred percent performance fee. And the money stays inside the hedge fund and I never redeem. And, you know, one day I could wake up and everything inside, I could open the black box and it could be empty because the broker's gone bust or because my system's gone crazy or I've just got my risk completely wrong. And all of those things I hope are pretty unlikely, but, you know. So that that level of kind of cash wealth inside that black box is basically set at a level where I am psychologically comfortable with that risk for me personally. So I'm kind of, I guess, semi-retired now effectively and have been for the last seven years. But when I retire properly and I no longer want to be trading futures, at that point I'll have a, if I just, if I do have my futures portfolio as quite a small proportion of my overall wealth, in terms of like rearranging my life, it's going to be quite relatively straightforward. If on the other hand, I had a massive futures account, which had been compounding and compounding over, you know, a couple of decades, then at that point I'd have to make, you know, some potentially quite big and also tax disadvantage decisions about reallocating my investments. So the other reason I'm allowing this proportion of my you know, trading account to, to, to gradually over time become a smaller and smaller portion of my wealth is basically a way of kind of naturally allowing that to happen so that when I eventually decide to stop trading futures and just sit on the beach all day uh, and not, not have to worry about whether my system's still running, then, then I won't be too much of my wealth that I have to play around with. So it's, a, it's an answer to which there's no psych, there's no kind of correct scientific answer. What I'm doing is scientifically suboptimal. Okay, it's not the correct thing to do, but psychologically and in terms of planning my life, it is what suits me. Sorry, Neil. Was you yeah, no, I mean that's fine. I mean it's a good question from John, but no, my only comment to that is what's counterintuitive. I mean, I I don't understand. I don't well, I don't know anything about UK tax, so so that I can't comment on. But my only gut feel when you say that because i think this is also relevant for a lot of other people 
And that is as we get older and where capital, you could say it's more important to preserve capital than it is as we're younger. I actually think you're doing the opposite. I actually think you are taking a lot more risk with your money in being in long only strategies for the most part when you retire. My view has always been that our trend following is actually what allows us to own equities and things like that. So that's my only comment is that I actually think that what we do in the trend following space, even as we get older, is important if we want to own equities because, you know, I know we have not seen it for a while, but we don't have to go back that far in history to see equities drop significantly and taking years and sometimes even a couple of decades to get back to where they were prior. And I'm talking about the 60s, early 70s, but also in from 2000 to 2011 or 12. It took a long time. So so when people say to me, well, you know, this future stuff over here, it's super risky. I don't really like it, but you know, I'll take it while I'm young, right? Actually, I think it's the wrong way around to look at things. I think it's super important at all part, parts of our life journey because it allows us to, I think, take a little bit more risk in the other part of the portfolio. But that's just my feeling. Yeah, no, I mean, it's important to me point out, Niels, that you know, when it comes to, for, to me to shut down my own futures trading, I, th- that chunk of money that I hopefully will still have in that black box, well, it may well be that I will then go and use that to, to buy you know, a couple of allocations to a trend following fund. In other words, right. effectively keep the it's same asset allocation, it. yeah. but it's not me doing it Fine. anymore. The other point to make, and I've said this on the podcast before, but I should have emphasized it more just now, those long, that long only investment chunk that I'm talking about is still something that is I'm actively managing. Yeah. So I'm still I still use trend following rules, for example, on on that, and I still you know have kind of it's just not automated. So sure. I think it will probably be the case that, that although I'm, I say I'm moving my money into long only strategies, there's still long only strategies which, for example, have momentum filters in them, and 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 so for example, if equities go down, we'll be selling equities as as they did last year. So so um, it's not just a pure long only allocation. So right. you know. In the round, my portfolio is still heavily exposed to momentum. And even if the proportion of that is futures trading is going down, that ex- that factor exposure is probably still remaining the same. Yeah, no, I think those are very important points, definitely, yeah. and, and makes a lot of sense yeah. for sure. All right, question from Peewee. And I hope you pr- I pronounce your name correctly. I'm not entirely sure. I sometimes get very uncertain when I see a name I haven't seen before. How do I pronounce it? So if I pronounce it incorrectly, I apologize, but that's what came up when I saw your name. He asks, you, Rob, if you could just trade five or six different futures markets, which ones would you pick? Besides Bitcoin, of course, now. Of course. I mean, that's got to be up there. So, I mean, actually, Pee Wee, I don't think it's his real name because this is actually his Twitter handle. And his, his, his Twitter handle is actually Pee Wee, Spanish flag, German flag, car, hospital sign, graph going down, graph going up, money bags, laughing face, hoverfly, heart, syringe, whale. So, okay. I think it's important to give people's full names on on the program i don't think that's his real name though unless his parents were very interesting creative Creative. yeah no the reason i'm I'm going on about this because is this actually a very hard question so i'm giving my brain time to think by just talking nonsense about peewee's twitter handle i mean the the thing is the the, i think what you have to say is well why would i be in a position where i could only trade five markets well it would probably be if i had very limited capital i've already been moaning about my limited capital that means i can only trade at the moment about 40 markets compared to a pool of perhaps 250 that I could trade if I had, you know, institutional levels of capital. So let's say my capital's been wound right down and I can only trade five markets. Well, the, the main thing I'd be looking for are markets that satisfy two criteria. Firstly, the position, the risk per contract was relatively small. So I could take, I wouldn't be just buying one contract, I'd be buying three or four, I'd be able to graduate positions a little bit. I'd want to be ideally to be to diversify across asset classes. So I wouldn't want to have five contracts that were all in, say, stocks. And I wouldn't want things that are too expensive to trade. So I wouldn't want any, you know, really expensive futures or that were too illiquid. So the normal kind of criteria that I'd apply. So it's going to be this difficult balance between finding five things that that kind of cover the main asset classes. So you probably want a stock index. You probably want a bond future. You probably want you know, an energy future and, and, a, and a metal and so on and so forth. 
So I'd have to do the work, to be honest, of actually looking at the individual contract sizes. So I know, for example, off the top of my head, that something like Eurostocks, I think, is, has got a reasonably small contract size. So that might well be a good choice for the equity contract, for example. I think corn is one of the smaller commodity contracts in terms of risk per contract. So maybe that would be my commodity contract. But yeah, so I, the important point here, of course, is I'm not picking based on what I think I could trade the best or even what I think my system could trade the best based on a back test. That's not going to come into my decision at all, because as we talked about earlier, my a priori starting point is that all markets are the same. So that the criteria for choosing those five markets is not going to be based on performance. It's going to be based on the best system I can construct with them in terms of diversification and contract size. What about you? What would be your five favorite contracts? No, I mean, so I think what I, th- I think here, what Wee is asking, if I was just going to completely disregard, you know, contract size and all of that good stuff, right? Let's just take that for a given. I think you're right. I mean, you know, I would probably pick, say, the US 10 year or the US 30 year as my fixed income market. I mean, yeah, you could pick Europe, but I mean, Europe is pretty even more controlled than the US maybe in, in, in the bond side. It makes sense to to do that. And again, you're always going to struggle if you can only pick one in each of these uh, quote-unquote sectors. So maybe you have to mix then and say, yeah, you maybe your suggestion say, okay, I've got the US fixed income, but let me pick a European stock market instead of a US stock market. So maybe your, the Eurostox 50 is a good market to pick. Makes sense. Base metals, probably copper, right? I mean, if you want a base metals exposure, that seems to be an, a natural choice. Again, you know, do you want precious metals? Of course, you would pick gold or silver, but I don't know if you could only pick five or six, whether you would even go down that. I think the other commodities are more interesting. You know, I think definitely one of the grains would make a lot of sense. Certainly one of the energies, you know, crude oil or, for example, would be important to have. You definitely also need a currency, right? So are you picking the euro or the British pound or or whatever? But it's going to be one of the majors against the US dollar yeah. if you want to have exposure to currency. So... I think the portfolio as a whole that that uh, P is, is asking for is almost going to reveal itself once you start looking at these types of things. And then you're also going to realize is, oh, it's completely inadequate to get the benefit of trend following because the benefit of trend following comes from trading at least, I would say, 25, 30 markets plus up until 50 or 60 markets. I think that's the sweet spot where you can get enough diversification without going crazy and trade 300 plus markets so but you know we all have to start somewhere so that's not a and that's not a bad place to to start although i would always repeat when we get asked about this i would always repeat and say that actually one of the secrets in my view to trend following success is the diversification across markets and i don't mean that you have to trade 300 i just mean that you can't take trend following and it traded on a few markets and expect quote unquote trend following returns that is not what i would expect because it's more luck uh, than skill when you do it like that which is also why people will always not always but often hear me say up until a certain point it's probably better just to allocate the money to someone who can give you the diversification until you have enough assets to get it yourself we need to move on to the next question from said if you don't mind because Mm -hmm. we've got two points we want to make uh, further as well said writes do you prefer equal position size or risk based on volatility if trading a diversified portfolio in what situations would you consider each like is there any situation in which it could be better to just divide capital by number of positions or equal risk base based on volatility I mean, you already know the answer. my answer to this question in terms of which I prefer. Obviously, it's the risk-based. The situation in which it would be okay to use equal cash weights would be where the risk and the correlation structure of the portfolio was fairly homogenous. So, for example, let's say you're buying, you know, the S&P 500. You're going to get a very marginal gain from using a risk-based approach to buying that portfolio versus just straightforward equal weights just you know you've got half a million dollars buy a thousand dollars of each stock and the reason for that is that the volatility of of the the assets within that portfolio are fairly similar so mostly the volatility of the stocks in the S&P 500 they're all large cap US stocks is going to be within roughly a factor of two so you might have some boring stocks that have got a annualized vol of 15 percent you might have some exciting things like Tesla are more like 30%. Most are going to fall within that range. So actually, you're not because it's quite a large portfolio, 
because it's quite representative across different sectors. So it's not like you've got, you know, 499 oil and gas companies in one bank, for example. You know, we're in a situation like that, doing a more of a, an equal risk contribution or risk parity would make more sense because you, you don't want to be over allocating to all of those oil and gas companies. With some emerging market indices, they're, they're a bit like that. S&P 500 has got fairly good sector sort of breakdown. So yeah, I mean, in layman's terms, the more similar the things you're trading are, the more likely it is that equal weights is just going to win. So actually, when I was describing my little fitting exercise earlier, what I didn't tell you is that as a benchmark, I used equal weights. And when I said the second best and the best, I was lying to you because the best actually was equal weights. Just using equal weights did better than all of my fa- fancy techniques did, although the difference was very small. And that was partly because I deliberately cherry picked a set of trading rules that that were kind of fairly well balanced, mainly so to make the results of the exercise more interesting. But by doing that, I'd effectively given equal weights a kind of free shot at doing really well. So yeah, the, the equal weight certainly has its place. And you know, if if you you've got something simple like say the five asset portfolio we talked about earlier, well, in that situation, the the volatility of those things is really quite different. So I really would caution you not to use equal weights. But if, if it's five randomly chosen, you know, large cap US stocks, then equal weights will probably do okay. Yeah. I mean, I think most people who listen to the to the podcast will know that we always size positions based on volatility of the market. And of course, both Jerry Moritz and, and my trend following portfolio, you know, we take the same amount of risk. We don't look at intramarket correlations in, in, in real time, so to speak. We just pick the markets and that's how it is. And you obviously, Rob, you do it slightly differently. But I think the good thing about this, and this goes to, I think, the testament of the robustness of the methodology or strategy or approach in general is that it's not like we're going to get massively different results. We may get a little bit different results from year to year. But in the long run, people should do whatever they feel is, is, is easiest for them to stick to the process. That's more important than than actually coming up with anything fancy. Absolutely. Speaking about fancy, we're going to move on to something fancy, I think, which is an article you found in the FT, which is how to defend against inflation. Now, this is co-authored by one of our guests on the Global Macro Series, Cam Harvey, who is a professor at Duke University, and who's also an advisor to Man Group. And I think it's he wrote it with Ben Funnel, who's a portfolio manager at Man Group. And I think it's also based on a research paper that two or three other people at Man wrote not long ago, which is called The Best Strategies for Inflationary Times. Now, the topic I find super interesting, and it's something we've actually talked about for quite a while here on our little podcast, because I do think that, just to set the scene, I think most portfolios today are actually set towards a continuation of this kind of quasi-deflationary environment, right? So if we are to see real inflation coming back, and of course we can argue whether we're already seeing it, it's not the point. But I think if we are to get real inflation that is somewhat longer lasting and not transitory as the Fed is expecting, then I think a lot of portfolios will struggle. I'm not saying that's going to happen, but I think if it did, a lot of portfolios will happen and that can have quite large consequences if people are going to retire and realize their portfolios are not quite as as big as they thought they would be. Anyways, I have to confess, I did not read the article because I knew you were going to read it. Uh, So uh, I'm going to let you take people through it and let's see where we go. Yeah, it's interesting because the co-author of the paper and also of the the paper you refer to there they are man group people but they're glg man group people so they're from the discretionary side of the business not the systematic side at ahl where i worked of course but yeah cam harvey of course is uh very was a very interesting guest and someone who knows a lot about about inflation and the yield curve and, and subjects like that so it was very interesting for me to read this piece because i think either the last time i was on the time before i i brought up a, a piece another sort of research piece that had been put out looking at this question of where, how different asset classes do in inflationary periods in the past, which obviously as systematic traders, we would kind of extrapolate into the next inflationary period, which we assume is coming, you know, if not next year, soon soon enough. Now, the difference between this article and the previous one was the previous one that looked at the real returns available in those pre- previous periods. So in other words, how well did assets actually beat inflation in those previous periods? So in other words, what assets are the best inflation hedge? This article takes a slightly different approach, which is to look at the best 
absolute returns in different previous inflationary periods. So it's not really about whether you'll beat inflation or not. It's about how well you'll do in absolute terms, which argue, which I think for a lot of people is perhaps more important. I don't think most people aren't that bothered about whether their portfolio matches or beats inflation exactly, because everyone's experience of inflation is different anyway. They just want a portfolio that, that's going to not seduce a bally or hopefully do well if, if inflation comes. But they did a similar exercise of cutting across different asset classes and measuring their previous uh, returns. And I remember when I brought up this piece earlier in the earlier podcast, Niels, you said quite rightly, well, what about trend following? And I had to say, well, this, but that particular analysis we looked at before did not have trend following in it. Of course, this one does. So I'm going to rank them from kind of bottom, bottom to top, if you like. So the worst performing asset in previous periods of inflation. And how about before you do that, yeah. how far back do they go in terms of determining periods of So they go back to 1926. Okay. That's fair. And they're using the the sort of using this they're doing a they did a breakdown by both kind of asset class, so just long only in a particular asset class, by factor, so like the value factor, the momentum factor, you know, the things like that so that you know and then but then also by like the smart beta factor if you like so there's the trend following and things like that so they cut it different ways and they use the, the standard farmer and french factors for the factors so assets that did badly in periods of high inflation so long only equity sectors particularly in the consumer durables so i guess those are companies like maybe like unilever that they don't have much pricing power i guess in terms of inflation for those I guess, more big ticket consumer durable items like washing machines, perhaps. US Treasuries 30 years in particular did very badly. Well, that kind of makes sense. You'd expect fixed things to sell off and the long end of the curve to sell off more. Actually, interestingly, private equity didn't do so well, which is I'm interesting. actually not surprised. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. Also, value as a, as a factor in inequities did, didn't do that well either, interestingly. Now, coming in with a very small positive return, and this may surprise people, were TIPS, Treasury, infla inf Treasury Inflation, inflation Protected Securities. So basically, these are things that effectively provide you with a perfect hedge against inflation. But in terms of their absolute return, it was pretty small. And the reason for that, of course, is that buying this perfect hedge against inflation is expensive. You know, inflation protected securities are expensive. When people are scared about inflation, they pay a lot of money to buy what is effectively perfect insurance against it. So so if you're w worried about beating inflation or at least matching it in a very precise way, then yeah, well, by all means, buy tips. But if you're not so worried about the hedge and just want to make money, then they're not such a good, interesting, such a good security. So let's look at some of the, the positive assets. So um, the good news is these are all things that I have in my own portfolio. So I'm very pleased about this. So wine was up there, which is obviously a very liquid I asset. I think that's the second time I've made a liquidity joke this episode. Yeah, I, I won't do any more. Co to commodities, long only commodities, gold, you know, not a huge surprise. I mean, but it, it's kind of a stylized fact that gold does well when inflation but funny happens. With gold, but, it, yeah. the gold does well in both and deflationary yeah. periods, right? It's kind of a It's, weird a, it's one. a funny old asset. But anyway, yeah. it's up there and the gold bugs will be pleased about that, sure. of course. Now, of course, they didn't look at cryptocurrency because that doesn't go back to 1926, but they said a few kind of words about, well, we don't think it, we, there's no evidence, obviously. And certainly based on recent experience, it doesn't look like it will be an inflation hedge. But, who, you know, we spent enough time talking about crypto in this episode, I think. Interestingly, energies as a commodity asset class did really well, even better than gold. And I, I, don't, I guess a lot of that's probably driven by the 1970s, when obviously oil went up a lot. And trend following is up there as well. So that, that's kind of nice to see for us, that trend following does, does almost as well as pretty much any other asset class when inflation's high. And it kind of makes sense, because if you get inflation in things like wheat and corn and lumber and, and things like that and energy markets. The financial markets, maybe the trends are less clear and you wouldn't, wouldn't maybe even lose money potentially in, in, say, fixed income if there was a, you know, a big inflationary move, unless it was a very clear move in fixed income, which is less likely, I would argue. But you more than make up for that with really strong trends coming in all the commodity asset classes. So, so yeah, an, an, interesting, an interesting piece and worth looking at. Yeah, and that actually plays into something that I can uh, reveal, which is that there is a new episode on the Top Traders on Plot series coming out very soon. People should check that out. And that is actually concerning, in some ways, why you need to put together strategies and investments, assets, etc., 
that do well in different regimes like Rob has just talked about. And so I'm not going to reveal exactly who the guest is just yet, but he's great and it's very educational. I think people will enjoy it quite a lot and I'll get it out in the next week or so for sure. Now, before we finish off this week's conversation, I do want to touch on another article that we found that was titled something like Manage Futures Fast or and furious or slow and steady. And what this article does, it's uh, we found it on a Factor Research website, factorresearch.com, under their insights. And what the article does, and you can talk more about it if you want, it basically talks about this. We have this friendly rivalry between kind of the longer term trend following strategies and the short term strategies. I, I don't even know if we can say that they're trend following, but they're short term strategies, but they all fall within the CTA space, right? And we as long-term trend followers, we like to say, yeah, but you know, long-term works best in the long run. There's no evidence, la la la. And short-term tr strategies, they they like to say, well, hang on, you know, these long-term strategies that don't work so well anymore, just look at how markets behave. They're moving so quick and the Federal Reserve and all that good stuff. And then there's obviously a couple of months uh, like February 18, where clearly short-term strategies did better and that gets classified as a crisis. And then suddenly we have to kind of defend our own crisis alpha label, et cetera, et cetera. So, so it's nice to find a little bit of research that is not coming from one of us. So we can be unbiased of the opinion. So with that set up, why don't you talk people through the article and, and its findings, so to speak, and then I will prepare my closing remark after that. Yeah, I'm definitely on the same page as you. And actually, I've just been rereading um, a book by Perry Kaufman, his massive encyclopedia of trading strategies. And there's a few recurring themes in there. And one is that the smaller the time frame, the more noise there is in the market and the, the fewer strong trends there are and the, the better you would be trading mean reversion. And certainly that's usually what my analysis has shown me. But Trying to put aside my, my own prejudice for the, I did look at the article. So they did a couple of interesting things. One was to look at some stock market crashes in the past and look at the performance of short and, and long term trading strategies. Because, you know, for example, we talked last year a lot about how we expected short term trend followers to do well in March last year when the market had a sort of classic V shape, you know, when the short term guys could probably have caught the ride down and the ride up. Whereas as long term guys, we, at best, missed it completely, or at worst, got whip, got whipsawed by it. And it, they do show that in last year's market crash, the short-term trend followers did outperform. They didn't actually make any money, but they did outperform. But then they looked at a bunch of other previous crashes and found that there was definitely a picture where, with one exception, I think in, in 2018, uh, the, the long-term stuff was doing better. The other argument that I'm finding a bit more sympathy for short-term trend following is it's less likely to be correlated with long-only markets. Because if you think about it, Stocks and bonds generally go up. That means that generally speaking, long-term trend followers are going to be long stocks and long bonds on average. They're going to have a positive beta there, right? Short-term trend followers are more likely to have a zero correlation with the market. And that means when you put these things into a portfolio with long-only assets, you might expect that although the, the performance of short-term trend following isn't as good, maybe the fact there's lower correlation means that overall it provides better diversification benefits. So that, that to me was the more interesting part of the piece. So they did actually do that. They did actually put together a portfolio of with 80% S&P and 20% various other asset classes. And they found that the, diversif the extra diversification effect from the short term wasn't sufficient to overcome the performance penalty. In other words, you were still better with long-term trend following. So, so yeah, I, I think for me, the, you know, the evidence is still there that trend following slower make, makes more sense as well as being easier because you know transaction costs are, are lower for example and you know you don't have to have such you can you know do your trading once a day and, and, and generally have a more relaxed life so yeah no i would say not easier to hold necessarily and not oh, easier no. mentally to yeah, yeah. kind of understand i think short term has a lot of advantages in that but as i certainly in my own mind have and in my own research have found long-term trend following is better categorically than short-term trading in the long run. It does not mean that short-term trend following or short-term traders can't outperform trend followers when there's a quick reversal. Of course they can. And therefore they both can serve a purpose in a portfolio. But what I will just add to that is that when I look at the short-term space, it's very hard for me to find 
any short-term managers that has done well for a long period of time, meaning they have a long track record. I can think of very few firms. And I think uh, it's easier for me to find trend followers, even though there are not a lot of us around anymore, kind of pure trend followers, but it is easier to find a few more names that have a long track record and actually done well over time. So, but it is definitely a field that is narrowing on both sides. And then I wonder if that's the case, that there are more long-term trend followers that do well. It certainly aligns with our internal research. When we look at different timeframes and we do our own research in terms of profitability over time, we also find the tr- that, you know, even if we actually don't, in our case, this is quite interesting maybe for people to know, we don't put a limit in terms of, oh, we can only choose 100 days or more in terms of our look back period. We actually want the data to tell us what is the best look back period. So we can let the model choose 20 days if it wanted. It just never does because there is no evidence that 20 day in the long run is going to be a particular profitable time frame or look back period. So, so no, we don't want to limit the the borders or whatever you call it, the spectrum of time frame, but the evidence confirms the findings of, of this study. Let me quickly run through some performance numbers. And this is, of course, as of Thursday evening, it's looking pretty solid for trend followers still. So May, almost at the end of May, it's uh, the beta 50 index is up 1.86% up 7% year to date. The Sokjian CTA index up 1.56% and for the month of May up 7.27% for the year. Sokjian trend index up 2.09%, up 9.15% year to date. Sokjian short-term traders index apropos down 59 basis points so far in May up 1.56% for the year. And then for people who follow the MSCI World Index, it's so far up 1.38% as of close of business last night. For the month of May, up 9.26% for the year. And the World Government Bond Index is up 14 basis points so far in the month of May. Rob, anything anything interesting you found before we wrap up? Anything you want people to go and check out other than your own blog post, of course? Yeah, just look at my blog. Absolutely. But also, Mark, whose surname I can never pronounce. Resimsinski, our uh, there friend. There you go. Resimsinski. Exactly. Mark yeah. was on last week. Yeah. Yeah. So Jerry actually tweeted a, a piece from his blog, which um, was also about this, this the same topic, inflation, different asset classes that, that was went into a, quite a lot of granular detail. So if, if you want some more of that kind of stuff, then go to Mark's blog and have a look at that. Yeah, definitely. That's a good one. And for me, I would say just because I found it interesting and because we did uh, do this thing about the Bitcoin stuff today, I, I certainly was reminded of this episode on Hidden Forces. I don't know the name of the guy, but it was about e- Ethereum, so it's easy to find if people want to dig into that. Other than that, if I was going to throw a curveball a little bit here, to talk about something that could be seen by some people as controversial, so I'm not shy of doing that, of course. That is, I came across a three-hour-long Joe Rogan podcast yesterday, since I had to do a, a drive in the evening, and this is with a guy called Josh Rogan. So not to be confused with Joe Rogan, the, the guest is actually called Josh Rogan, G-I-N, And it's a few weeks ago or a few days ago since he was on. And this is about, he's a Washington Post reporter and he basically is writing, he's written a book and it's about kind of the whole situation about how the Wuhan virus broke out, so to speak. He's trying to get the facts. He doesn't have an opinion about whether it was the lab or whether it wasn't the lab but he wants to get to the truth of it. The first 45 minutes, I think you can skip. That was just chit-chatting and fun stories and, and so on and so forth. But from about 45 minutes on, they get into this. And I actually found it to be quite an interesting conversation on a completely different topic, of course. But I do find that when you come across people who've really done their homework and their research, and of course, this is a topic that is very relevant for the world, you learn a lot about how the Chinese think differently than we do in the West and the US in particular, you find out how, if it really was a fault of the labs, you find out why that is not good news for the US either. It's quite interesting. It's not as straightforward as we might think. 
So I would encourage people with two hours and 15 minutes to spare to check that out. Yeah, it has been interesting how the uh, the whole lab thing has gone from being complete bug-eyed conspiracy theory stuff to being, well, actually, it's not that unlikely. And Josh Rogan is a serious guy. I mean, he's a Washington Post. And I've not heard the podcast you're referring to, but I have read some stuff that he's written recently. And I don't think we'll ever know one way or the other, to be honest. There's probably a few people in China who know, but there's no way they're going to be allowed to tell the truth so and it doesn't really they're not around anymore or they're not around anymore and it, it doesn't but the way if the chinese communist party is listening we love you guys as well and part of me thinks well the coronavirus is out it perhaps doesn't matter anymore how coronavirus got out into the world it's out and and it's killed a lot of people and it, it's a terrible thing the court the underlying cause isn't relevant but of course it matters for the future because you know, if there are lots of labs, yeah, also in the US that have got things in there that are you know, far worse than coronavirus that, that have been developed either for research purposes or po- possible military applications, and then it's absolutely terrifying. And perhaps we should be more scared about that than all the nuclear bombs that, that are sitting around mostly rusting. I'll leave you with two thoughts about the conversation, excuse me, about the conversation, which I thought was quite interesting. Okay, so f- first of all, people have to understand that whilst the as this discussion about was it the labs or wasn't it the labs was going on, you could say that the way in the West we were kind of just struggling with, okay, are we gonna wear a mask? Are we not gonna wear a mask, right? But in China, they saw this huge potential amount of people dying. We're at three million worldwide so far. And every single death coming with a lawyer and a lawsuit, right? That's what they were reacting to. So completely different risk assessment, okay? The other thing that I thought was very interesting, and that is apparently these labs have been funded with about 200 million US dollar taxpayer dollars every year. I think it's every year he meant. So, you know, the US can't say that they're not involved in these labs. They are involved to some extent anyway. And But the labs purpose to begin with was to collect viruses and find out how dangerous they were and blah, 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 so they could be prevented. That's the whole point, right? So like with everything else we do, or at least that often governments and authorities uh, are involved in, they did not see this coming. They did not prevent it, right? So what has the response been? They've doubled, they've sixed, whatever you call it, six tubled, tubled, whatever, six times the amount of money is now the plan to be allocated to this research. What a great solution. You failed. Here's another 1.2 billion. Go figure that out, right? So those were just some of the interesting conclusions that I had no knowledge about before I started listening, and I found it interesting. Another really interesting thing is that next week we have a returning guest to the Systematic Investor Series, which is Eric Crittenden, stepping in for Morris next week. Eric is super interesting to listen to. As people know, he and his firm has done a lot of work in trying to get people to, let's take the medicine with uh, with a little bit of sugar, meaning that they are blending trend following with uh, long equities so that it's easier maybe to get into the portfolios. We'll talk about how that's going because they actually started their fund exactly on gen- in January of 2020. And you couldn't really have asked for a better time to start. And I really mean that because they got their stress test within three months. So we're going to find out how that all worked and talk a lot about interesting things. So if you have questions for Eric, send them to info at toptradersonplug.com and uh, we'll get into that. I think it's going to be a fascinating conversation. I think that's pretty much what I've got for today. Rob, anything else? Final words? No, I think we should flag this episode on the page as Skip the first 45 minutes if you don't want to hear about crypto and skip the last 10 if you don't want to hear about coronavirus. But everything in the middle is fine. And with all that crypto, can we still mark it as a clean episode, Rob? Or is it a little bit now out there now? You know how Apple podcasts are. Yeah, I don't know. We need to be careful. We need to be careful. Yeah, we need to be careful. And of course, to anyone who's involved with the regulation or the Communist Party, we love you still. From Rob and me, thanks so much for listening. We look forward to being back with you next week. In the meantime... Take care of yourself and take care of each other. Thanks for listening to the Systematic Investor Podcast Series. If you enjoy this series, go on over to iTunes and leave an honest rating and review. And be sure to listen to all the other episodes from Top Traders Unplugged. If you have questions about systematic investing, send us an email with the word question in the subject line to info at toptradersunplugged.com and we'll try to get it on the show. 
And remember, all the discussion that we have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their products before you make investment decisions. Thanks for spending some of your valuable time with us, and we'll see you on the next episode of The Systematic Investor.